Jonathan Howard is double-boarded in neurology and psychiatry, and as he puts it in his Twitter profile, the author of several non-best-selling neurology textbooks. But that's not why he's being interviewed. He also co-authored a book chapter entitled The Anti-Vaccine Movement, A Litany of Fallacy and Errors, in the book Pseudoscience, A Conspiracy Against Science. And he wrote his own book on fallacy and errors in medicine entitled Cognitive Errors and Diagnostic Mistakes, A Case-Based Guide to Critical Thinking in Medicine. So we discuss some of the cognitive biases that people use when they decline vaccines, like the nirvana fallacy, anecdotal fallacy, and conspiracy theories. In some ways, the decision to vaccinate or not can be inordinately complicated, almost as if every step of the scientific process needs to be vetted by each individual getting the vaccine. So our goal as physicians should be to ease the cognitive load of the decision-making. So we talk about how we can accomplish this. Dr. Howard did his residency and fellowship at NYU, where he is now an associate professor of neurology and psychiatry, specializing in multiple sclerosis. He is the neurology clerkship director and director of neurology at Bellevue. He can be found on Twitter at jhowardbrainmd. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Before we get into the show, here's a quick message from Resolve, a physician contract review company. At Resolve, they believe that knowledge is power for physicians, and that power gives you control over your financial future. Resolve believes that by mining, analyzing, and synthesizing data, they can provide you with the information and insight that empowers you to diagnose the health of your career, fully understand your worth, and maximize your full potential. As a company founded by a doctor for doctors, Resolve Focus is on the well-being of those whose purpose in life is to care for the well-being of others. To have this incredible company review your employment contract, find them at drpodcastnetwork.com slash resolve. The link is also in the description of the show. Dr. Jonathan Howard, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. So I have been a fan of yours on Twitter for a Uh, while. Uh, One of the reasons is I've seen you interact with the anti-vaccine community, and it seems mm -hmm. like you're able to predict how they're going to reply with, with a lot of precision. So it seems like the reason you can do that is they have this predictable pattern, this, this pattern of reasoning. Can you walk us through some examples of how you know what's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, for better or for worse, I've been I've been doing this for a while. You know, just discussing uh, uh, vaccines online. I, I've sort of taken a little bit of a break from it recently, but maybe I'll I'll, I'll get back into it. And, and you know, one of the reasons that I did this was to sort of learn about vaccines myself and learn learn about some of the techniques that anti vaxxers use. And initially, when you encounter some of these arguments, some of them are very superficially persuasive, right? For example, they will show you graphs that, uh, you know, when the measles vaccine came out, the, you know, the, the measles deaths had fallen dramatically. And so the vaccine didn't really save us, as, as, but that's what the, the argument that David Gorsky uh, uh, calls it, another vaccine advocate, when in fact, what you have to realize is that the incidence of these diseases, even though measles was killing many fewer people happily by the, the 1960s, there were still millions of cases of this every year. And so anti-vaccine advocates do fall into predictable patterns. And there's the, you know, that, the idea that I just mentioned that vaccines didn't save us. Of course, that everything bad that ever happens to anyone who gets a vaccine is due to the vaccine, that vaccine preventable diseases are no big deal. They're just harmless childhood illnesses, that nutrition and sanitation saved us. So there, there, there's a whole very predictable pattern uh, that these vaccine uh, refusers fall into, that vaccine uh, vaccines aren't tested for safety. Uh, there's no true placebo studies. And one thing that's, that is sort of interesting about vaccine refusal is how it reveals the fears of the person who's refusing the vaccine. So people in the United States have different fears than people in other parts of the world. We're 
autism isn't very feared, for example, you know, people in other parts of the world, what they fear vaccines will cause are much more culturally specific. So it's a very interesting thing to observe that way. Would you say that it, for some of them, it's, it's showing their privilege, right? Like, because we don't live in a world where people are dying of measles and smallpox and being um, hobbled by polio, right? This We're just not seeing this where we live. And so they can then point out the potential negativities because they're not seeing the positives. Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting. A year ago, I probably would have said that, but this year obviously changed everything. Yeah. What will happen when people refuse the COVID vaccine, even though it's killing 3,000 Americans per day? Can, can we really make that argument too, that is from a place of privilege? You know, I don't know if we can uh, anymore, uh, especially here in the United States, where we're, you know, the leading epicenter uh, of this outbreak. So, yeah, I mean, I think that probably a year ago, I would have argued that at least some aspect of vaccine refusal is that vaccines have worked so well that they've rendered vaccine preventable diseases memories. And, you know, I think I've seen one case of measles in my life. I could easily go another you know, 20 years before I see one. You know, I have seen polio, but only uh, in people who contracted it, uh, you know, in the 1960s or 70s, often outside of the United States. You know, the only routine vaccine preventable disease that I saw pre-COVID was besides the flu, which, you know, the vaccine is not the best for that, but it was shingles. That's the only one that I routinely saw pre-COVID. So, so I think in the past, I probably would have made that argument. But given that there's probably going to be a lot of refusal of the COVID vaccine, I don't know if that really makes sense anymore, at least here in the United States. What do you think we're going to be seeing in terms of the reasons for refusal, in terms of cognitive biases? Yeah. So for the COVID vaccine. For the um, COVID, specifically for the COVID yeah. vaccine, yeah. So one, you know, one thing that's that's interesting about the anti-vaccine movement is it's a it's a very diverse <laughs> movement. It's probably actually, you know, more diverse than any other, you know, institution. You know, it encompasses, you know, very sort of, uh, you know, left-wing hippies, or at least people I would have sort of traditionally thought of left-wing, sort of back to nature, although they're kind of merging in interesting ways with the with the, with the far right. But of course, the far right, the sort of very libertarian, it's my body, my choice. Um, black community, I, I read today, is probably going to have some of the lowest uptake of this vaccine, unfortunately, for historical reasons, due to just general distrust of the medical community. So I think the, the it's going to be very hard to pigeonhole people who refuse the COVID vaccine. And of course, people who refuse the COVID vaccine, it's a little bit different than people who refuse the MMR, which has been around for 50 years, which has been studied in you know, tens of thousands of studies and billions of people have received that vaccine. So it's going to be a little bit different. And it, 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 ideally, it will be less of a problem in that for the next six months, at least, supply is, or demand for the vaccine is going to far outstrip supply. So maybe it's not bad that some people are going to refuse the vaccine, at least initially. There's, there's more for the people who are going to want it. You know, and I predict probably, you know, 50 to 60 percent of Americans will be, you know, lining up to get the vaccine the very first second it's available to them. Probably another 20 percent will, you know, wait and see what happens. And maybe by the summer or the fall, uh, you know, will accept it. And another 10 to 20 percent will probably reject it uh, basically no matter what I'm, you know going to be off a little bit on some of those numbers, of course, but that's that's kind of imagine how I things are going to shake out. And one can hope that we can achieve some semblance of herd immunity uh, with the vaccine. And, you know, the fact that, you know, what percentage of Americans have contracted COVID already? 10%, 15%, you know, and it's not really clear that natural immunity is as good as vaccine-induced immunity. You know, there's a ton of unanswered questions about this vaccine, and those questions will only be answered over time over the next decade or so. Specifically, though, cognitive fallacies or, or heuristics, please let me know if I'm using these, these words incorrectly. Which of those do you think are going to be applied more commonly? I, I, what I want the audience to be prepared for is that when they hear someone or encounter someone online, right? Let's say one of their family members, you know, they post their, I got my COVID shot post on their Facebook page. And then one of their family members jumps in and tries to undermine confidence in the vaccine. 
Uh, I think in that specific context, where physicians, it, the onus is on us in that situation. Fine, if you want to block trolls, I understand. But if it's a family member, I, I think it's important to address it. What yeah. do you anticipate as being the the fallacies that are going to be utilized by the specifically people that are anti-COVID vaccine? Sure. So the, 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 be rare before. I think probably one of the um, most common ones, uh, boy, this is a Latin phrase. I'm going to totally botch it, but the ipso fact post facto fallacy, but just, you know, if, you know, that, that, that just because something happens after someone gets a vaccine, it's due to the vaccine. I think it's post hoc ergo proctor hoc. Oh, thank you for rescuing me. Boy, and, I, knew, I butchered that much worse than I thought. I probably It's a West it. Wing episode. That's the okay. only reason I know that. All right, but you knew it. I didn't. Um, and uh, <laughs> that was pretty impressive. Anyways, um, so, so I think our, our social media feeds are just going to be filled with, with these stories of Jane was a healthy 22-year-old girl who got the COVID vaccine and a week later, you know, had diagnosed with a brain tumor. The odds that she, you know, healthy 20-year-old had a brain tumor are one in a million. And these stories are going to be very emotionally compelling to us, right? So we tend to make decisions you know, based on emotion and, and, and a story of a single person with a potential bad outcome from a vaccine is often much more persuasive to people than the raw data, right? So you can send people the the 95-page uh, FDA summary of the Pfizer vaccine and then say, oh, look, you know, in this trial of you know, 30,000 people, uh, there were, you know, 10 brain tumors, and they were equally distributed between the placebo and the vaccine group. And that's just not going to be very emotionally compelling. And of course, it's a new vaccine. We should keep an open mind that there are going to be side effects that uh, are unanticipated. And it's a new technology, this mRNA mRNA vaccine. So we, we do have to keep an open mind, but only science can really determine causality. Already just today, uh, there were two cases in the UK of people who potentially had an allergic reaction to the vaccine. These were people who already, and I only know what I read in the news, so you know, people listening you know, probably know more than, more than me, some people, uh, but at least uh, you know, I don't know, have any inside information, of course, but you know, two people who carry EpiPens with them, so they have a propensity to allergies in one way or another, you know, develop some sort of reaction. And, you know, we, is that due to the vaccine? Probably. We have to definitely keep an open mind. I have no idea if they were serious. Maybe someone had a little bit of shortness of breath and, you know, that was called some sort of, you know, reaction, you know, who knows. But we have to be very careful and be on guard about that. And it's oftentimes that once a medicine has been in the real world, that very rare side effects are seen, that these might not pop up in the clinical trial. Is that something that we should be counseling our patients about now? For instance, should we be saying, should we be preparing them for crazy stuff happens to people every day? And when you roll out a vaccine to 50 million people in a very short period of time, crazy stuff still happens to people every day. And so they're going to think that it's, so if we tell people about that beforehand and kind of prepare them for those messages, do you think that'll help? I mean, I, yes, I, 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 I certainly hope it'll help my patients. I have been doing that. You know, they have been, the, the main disease that I treat, by the way, is multiple sclerosis. And a lot of patients there, uh, you know, feel extra vulnerable to COVID um, and, you know, wonder if they're going to suffer extra vaccine side effects. I know very reasonable questions. And yeah, you know, I've been preparing them for this. I've been saying, you know, your social media feed will very soon fill up. Uh, with horror stories uh, of, of bad things that have happened to people after they got the vaccine. And, you know, just be aware uh, that that we're going to be vaccinating, ideally, in the next six months, you know, 100 to 200 million Americans. And I saw a very great infographic today just saying if you took 10 million people and waited two months, 10,000 would get cancer, 6,000 would have a heart attack, 6,000 would have a stroke, 5,000 would die, 60, they happen to have MS on there, 60 would get MS. You know, so, so we have to be very, prepare our patients that, yeah, you know, if I gave 100,000 Americans a cookie and waited six months, you know, very bad things would happen to, to some of them and very improbable things would happen <laughs> to, to, to some of them. It's a, it's a guarantee. So I'm having those conversations with my patients now, but I'll stress again, you know, as doctors and scientists, we have to be open to the possibility 
that the vaccine is responsible. And I think this is one way that we uh, tend to differ from the anti-vaccine movement, I hope, ideally at least, is that we sort of try to make up our minds by science and, and, and by data. And, you know, if it emerges, you know, once this Pfizer vaccine has been given to 10 million people and the rate of disease X is 10 times what it normally is, that we have to Keep it, you know, wonder if the vaccine is responsible, assuming there's at least some degree of biological plausibility there. So what you're talking about is the anecdotal fallacy, correct? That like an, that an anecdote about a negative event is much more powerful than the numbers because the human brain just can't contemplate, it can't fathom that the likelihood of getting something is one in 10,000 and your likelihood of dying of COVID is one in 1,000. So logically, but you know someone that was one, that one in 10,000. And so it's going to be much more powerful. Right. And, you know, we, we, we use this, you know, we're, we're just as guilty of this. You know, when, when I talk to my friends or they ask me, you know, they'll often ask me, you know, what was your experience with, you know, drug A, B, or C, you know, did, you know, have you had success with this? And, you know, you know that if you sat the person down, uh, you know, they would know that this is really not the, the the right way to get information. The best information is what evidence is there in the medical literature uh, that drug, you know, A works for condition B. You know, being a neurologist, I treat a lot of very rare diseases for which uh, there's no, you know, no really good evidence to, to, to guide us. But, you know, but you get my point. I mean, how many times have you had a conversation with a friend? You know, what has your experience been this way? So, and if one of your friends says, oh my God, I tried drug A and the patient's head exploded, you would never use drug A again. Um, so, so, so we're all guilty of this. Although in surgery, it's a little different because it might be, what was your experience using this instrument or using this device? And it's much harder in that arena to placebo control, though there are some placebo control. There was a placebo control balloon sinuplasty trial where they, they compared it to sham balloon, which I thought that study was, was amazing. But it's it's really hard to do stuff like that. So yeah, sometimes no, no. we, we I mean, do have to rely on that. Right. I mean, you know, when I began my training uh, as a neurologist, there was a very common procedure called vertebroplasty, which was used for vertebral compression fractures, essentially injecting cement. And after the procedure, uh, every patient felt better and the images looked beautiful. But it was finally subject to, as all practices in medicine ideally should be, uh, to a, a sham trial it didn't work. Everyone felt better. So I think these, these these sorts of studies are very important in medicine. But the good news about the anecdotal sort of fallacy is that we can use this to our advantage too, that we can. And I, I'd almost like to think that we doctors have an obligation to do this. I, I don't know if everyone would agree with me, but I, I would love it if every doctor who's on social media uh, put a picture of them getting a vaccine. And I, I just think that would be a very powerful thing. What cognitive bias is that utilizing? So I think it's two things, the anecdotal bias, right? You know, I got the vaccine and I was fine. And also, you know, we're very social creatures. We take our cue, none of us think this about ourselves, right? We, we always think, every person thinks I'm independent. I think for myself, everyone else thinks, you know, it's, it's, it's other people, you know, who are sort of swayed by the masses, you know, but, but look around, you know, we all pretty much dressed the same, right? Like when I give a talk, I wear, put on a tie and a shirt, even though I feel very uncomfortable in that. I'd much rather go outside in my pajamas all the time, but I don't because I know that that's socially unacceptable sort of peer pressure, you know, ha has made me do that. So I think if we normalize uh, getting the vaccine, the bandwagon effect would, would be the right thing to call this. And, you know, the same way it has worked at least where we live here in New York for masks. I mean, if you were to walk into a store without a mask right now, it'd be like walking into a, uh, a store without pants. You'd just be, it'd just be obscene almost. And I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned the pants just because I, I want my, <laughs> my listeners to hear something because something that I've been pushing on Twitter that hasn't quite taken off is for all of the people that, that say that, well, masks are really the, the first step in getting control of you and, and it's an effort to exert control. My counter argument is no, that started with pants. Yes. <laughs> if you really want the government to not be able to exert control because they already have it with pants, down with pants. And someone else actually came up with that hashtag, hashtag down with pants. Yes. Yeah. So, so that's the counter argument. Hashtag you know, so I, get it trending. Right. So I, so I think that if we can, you know, normalize it and just sort of say, listen, 
you know, we are all doing this. I mean, I, here's anecdotally, uh, what I have found most effective with my patients is I tell them correctly, I'm in one of the vaccine trials and I am, I'm in the, the AstraZeneca trial. So I tell them I've already gotten this vaccine, I think, uh, you know, officially, I don't know, but, you know, based on my reaction, I'm pretty darn sure I didn't get the placebo. And, you know, once they hear that, you know, they, they say, oh, really? Okay. Um, you know, that you're willing to put your money where your mouth is. So I just think of social media was flooded with doctors and scientists, you know, and all sorts of people uh, getting the vaccine that would be very powerful and would have different effect on different communities. Um, you know, I would have, uh, you know, impact on, I don't know, no one, you know, 45 year old balding white guys in Manhattan community, you know, but, you know, but we need, you know, we, we, we really need diverse group of doctors and scientists and you don't have to be a doctor or scientist, you know, you could be a, a church leader, a coach, you know, anything like that. And I, I just hope that sort of uh, over time, uh, it'll be sort of overwhelming peer pressure in, in a good way. And this is another thing that I think uh, sometimes, uh, you know, people who refuse vaccines do. It's, 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 it's the opposite of the, the bandwagon effect, which is just being oppositional for the sake of being oppositional. You know, saw someone, a, a joke meme or something like that, that, that uh, someone was was told masks were banned and outlawed and so they you know went outside in one and 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 uh you know said you know no government is going to tell me I can't wear a mask and uh so I think a lot of people are just going to do the opposite for the sake of doing the opposite and you know you, you can't reach everyone um and and so you know when I discuss vaccines online you know my my goals have changed a little bit initially it was sort of for me to sort of learn about this and and this sort of thing I, I think if you're debating hardcore conspiracy theorists there's no point in arguing with them maybe someone may stumble on the conversation and, and, and see that and I think that this is the time to make favorable honest honest but favorable impressions about the covid vaccine because there are a lot of people whose mind isn't made up right now and I, 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 you know, some doctors on social media disagree with me about this, but if pro-science doctors keep 100% quiet, the zone is just going to be flooded with conspiracy theories about, I mean, they've already started that the vaccine is going to make you infertile, which is not a new, uh, new one. There, it's just going to be a, a deluge and, and, and pro-science people have a hard time keeping up because we're limited by data, right? Up until, I guess, two weeks ago, you know, if you would ask me, what is your opinion of the COVID vaccine? I would say hopeful because I didn't have any data to back up. There, there was nothing, to, there was no nothing to feel about it. It's like asking me who I, you know, what do I feel about the Super Bowl winner in the year 2030? Well, it hasn't happened yet. So I have no feelings about that. But the anti-vaccine movement got a head start, that's for sure. And they were already sort of spreading conspiracy theories about the vaccine. Yeah, I think uh, we, being in the position that we're in, I sometimes have to, Tell my patients that, that I, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you like a human being. I have to talk to you like a doctor. So I can't tell you this will work. I just have to tell you, I have no reason to believe that this won't work, which is not the same thing. You know, I can't make any guarantees. I can't make any promises. We have to just work with the information that we have. And I can't speak with, with the conviction that, you know, one of your friends might when they're, when they're talking to you. Yeah, no, this has been, been written about the journalist, I'm probably going to butcher his name, Seth Nukin, M-N-O-O-K-I-N, you know, wrote a book called The Panic Virus, I, I believe it's called, but about the anti-vaccine movement and about, he, you know, he's not a scientist, but that's one thing he noted is that doctors and scientists tend to speak in very precise but sort of wishy-washy ways. They would say, for example, there is no evidence that vaccines cause autism. Okay. But that sort of leads the possibility that the study, you know, that they could, you know, that the studies haven't been done. You know, meanwhile, anti-vaxxers would say vaccines cause autism. And I think certain doctors have, have learned from this and to sort of say that it's okay to say vaccines don't cause autism. You know, can you strictly speaking say that never one in 10 billion times vaccine may induce some sort of inflammation in the brain that leads to autism? Sure, it's possible. You can never 100% rule something out. But for the sake of, of communication, it's, it's fair to say vaccines don't cause autism. And I think that we can when we encounter outlandish claims about the COVID vaccine, you know, we should say, no, it doesn't do that. 
And, and, and I, I think that's a fair thing for us to say and do. So earlier we were talking about the anecdotal fallacy, right? Can we use that to help increase vaccine uptake? Meaning, you know, we've seen what COVID does, right? And so one thing that I've started doing with my patients, and please, like the, one of the reasons we're having this is to help me be, improve my interactions with my patients. But what I've been saying is it's not, you're not deciding whether you want the vaccine or not. You're deciding whether you want the vaccine or COVID. And we know what COVID does. We've seen what COVID does. We've seen it overrun our hospitals, our communities, our morgues. and and for the patients that do survive, many of them have lasting effects. So that's your one choice or the vaccine, which is new. And that is scary because it's new. But this is the decision that you're making. You're not deciding vaccine or not. You're deciding vaccine or COVID. So can we use the anecdotal fallacy and tell, you know, I knew, you know, obviously without violating HIPAA, but we've certainly seen enough patients that you can create a melange story. and you know, tell them about someone that had COVID. Yeah, no, this, this has been studied and this is one of the ways that has been shown to be effective in influencing patients to, to take a vaccine is to tell them the stories of vaccine or show pictures of vaccine preventable diseases. And I think that um, this has been one of the, the strange things about the pandemic is that so much suffering has happened in, invisibly behind doors uh, that's invisible to see. And up until recently, Many corners of the country were untouched. Unfortunately, that's no longer the case. So I think the number of people saying, you know, COVID is a hoax and, you know, it's not so bad. It's just the flu. I, I, I think, uh, and tragically, I would have loved to have people go to their graves believing that if we had controlled the spread of the disease. And, you know, that's one of the ironies of public health is that the more successful you, you are at, at, at doing it, the more it seems like you overreacted. So. I certainly do that. I say to patients things along the lines of, if you saw what I saw this spring, because New York's main surge was in the spring, I think in many ways, actually, New York might be luckier than the rest of the country by the time this is all over. But I, I tell them correctly, you know, if you saw what I saw, you know, you would be, you, you would think a little differently about the risk benefit ratio of this vaccine. And, you know, they want more information. I tell them, you know, that I saw two patients per ICU room. I saw, you know, the youngest person I saw die was 23. I would come in every day and half my patient list had changed because they were dead and, you know, new ones had taken over. And I tell them that my main recollection of this time will be actually sounds, sounds that they heard, the sirens just wailing 24-7 through the empty streets of New York City and sounds that they didn't hear of you know the the airway team page every five minutes over the hospital intercom you know airway team you know room you know seventeen north bed twenty three airway team room you know sixteen east bed twenty seven just constant in the hospital so I think you know I alluded to earlier maybe I didn't say this but you know one of the other techniques of the anti vaccine movement is to downplay the effect you know downplay the risks of vaccine preventable diseases. That measles. Oh, when I was growing up, everyone got measles, and you know we spent the you know we spent a couple of days at home and got ice cream. It was great, and you know oh chicken pox. You know I I had chicken pox. I did, and you know I don't remember it. I have like a little scar on my forehead, but you know it wasn't a big deal. You know do we really need a vaccine against chicken pox? You know there are going to be some people out there who are going to say COVID is a just a little cold, you know, even if half the country was to die. But but unfortunately, I think there's probably going to be, you know, very few people by the time this is all over who aren't going to, you know, probably everyone is going to know multiple people who got sick. And, you know, probably most Americans are going to know someone who died or know we secondhand someone who died, unfortunately. So we've, we've talked about anecdotal fallacy. We can use that telling our patient stories, the bandwagon effect show them that we're getting the vaccine, show them on social media, tell our patients that we're getting it. Anything else that we can use to lighten the cognitive load of the decision-making for, for getting the vaccine for our patients? So I think, I think those are the, the, the main ones. And I, I think it's important, you know, even though we do want to lighten the load, that we have to give patients facts and raw numbers. So I, uh, again, I mentioned the, the main disease that, that, that I treat is as MS. 
And I have a, a very long book that I email to patients. It's just, you know, I shouldn't even call it a book, but a Word document, you know, the answers to frequently asked questions for newly, for patients with, with MS. And, you know, I have a section on MS and COVID, which is relatively new. And I will probably have a section uh, on the vaccine that I will update uh, periodically. And I think some people can be very persuaded with, with facts and logic. It's not just pure emotion that if we're able to say uh, in March, something along the lines of, you know, 50 million Americans have gotten vaccinated so far. And, you know, so far, no safety signals have emerged. Again, talking about the facts of this vaccine, one of the main things that we're going to hear about it is that it was rushed, right? That That's going to be one of the main sticking points for people. Well, but, when you call it Operation Warp Speed, yes, it makes it sound rushed. You know, for, for someone who's really good at marketing and messaging, uh, this, this, I think, was a misstep. That was noted from day one. Yeah. But I think we can reality test with patients a little bit and say things along the lines of, well, research on coronavirus vaccines has been going on since 2012 or so. Uh, this is not the first coronavirus that has attacked uh, American or attacked people. You know, SARS and MERS were coronaviruses. Other vaccines, at least the trial that I'm in, the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, an Ebola vaccine has been approved using that technology. So it's it's a mistake to, even though this vaccine was developed in record speed in terms of uh, from start to finish, no shortcuts were taken. It was studied in as large a group of people as any vaccine trial, and the vaccine trials lasted the same amount of time as other vaccine trials. It just happened to go quickly for a few reasons. Uh, obviously, money was no object. The drug companies threw everything they had at this with some of the help of the government. And the second reason, tragically, is that the disease was spreading so rampantly that it took no time at all to show that the vaccine worked. So these factors allowed the vaccine trials to be done in a faster time than usual, but no shortcuts were taken. And obviously the third thing is they had no trouble recruiting volunteers for studies, you know, Americans, altruistic ones, uh, you know, doing heroic things. I don't want to pat myself on the back too much for being <laughs> in one of these trials, but, you know, people who are participating in medical research are doing a heroic thing. I, I really feel that way. You know, so everything, and then the, the, the fourth factor was luck that this vaccine is not mutating a lot, um, excuse me, that the virus is not mutating, that the spike protein seems very immunogenic. So, so there was some luck involved, but everything had to go perfectly for these vaccines to be developed and, and everything did go perfectly. Again, with the exception of the uncontrolled spread, it would be much nicer if we were having you know, 2,000 cases a day and, you know- Which might would have taken longer. I, I actually didn't even, that didn't even occur to me that- because it was so uncontrolled, it allowed us to prove faster that it was working because an adequate number of people were exposed to it to prove Correct. that it was working. So if you, it, wanted to, yeah. if you wanted to test this vaccine in Taiwan or New Zealand, you wouldn't have a snowball's chance in now or yeah. Australia even because they have no cases. They, they've, yeah. kept, they've kept the disease out. So yeah, America has proven to be a perfect testing ground. <laughs> You know, it's, it's oh, tragic, terrible. Yeah, it's tragic, but it allowed us to get a vaccine. Obviously, you wish, again, I wish we were having 2,000 cases a day and we were snuffing this out the old-fashioned way yeah. you know, through through isolation and contact tracing. That'd be much, much more preferable. Uh, but, 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 you know, so, so I, in talking about cognitive biases, you know, we can make rational decisions. We can, you know, we can do that. So I think that uh, it's, it's, it's important to do that to give people the facts and the raw information and, and, and you know, people, people can hear that. And then finally to, to appeal to some semblance of altruism that yes, you're 20. If you get COVID, you'll probably be fine, but you may spread it to someone who isn't. And we don't know the long-term effects of COVID. There are certain viruses like chicken pox, which can reemerge years later as shingles or HPV which can cause cancers years down the road. Coronavirus probably won't do that, but you can't know for sure. And if you're worried about getting a vaccine, which you don't feel has been adequately tested, uh, there have been exactly zero safety studies of the coronavirus itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or to the extent that it has been tested, it's been found to be very unsafe. 
so so I, I I I hope that people can can think about this rationally uh, in some way as well. And I think that's the a bit of the Nirvana fallacy, right? The Nirvana fallacy is that that something is going to be absolutely safe with no side effects whatsoever. Uh, and the example that I've and I, I learned it from from you. Uh, the example is stairs, right? People fall down the stairs all the time, yet we still have yeah. stairs, right? Correct. Everything carries risk. Getting in the yeah. car carries risk. And so the 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 virus, not the virus, the, the vaccine may carry risk, but we're studying it and we don't know the long-term risks of the, the disease itself. Correct. Yeah, I, I did not come up with the Nirvana fallacy, but it's essentially the idea uh, is applied to vaccines, that a vaccine isn't worth taking if it's not 100% safe and it's not 100% effective. So sometimes you'll encounter that argument. So yes, I think that appealing to people's altruism and to their rationality isn't necessarily a lost cause. So you had spoken earlier about needing to examine the data behind the vaccine to make sure that if it becomes problematic, that we recognize it. And it makes me think of Ignaz Semmelweis, right? Mm. The guy who figured out that washing our hands prevents infections, right? So I think nowadays everyone kinds of, there are all these fringe experts that all think that they're the Ignaz Semmelweis of our time and they get dismissed by mainstream medicine. How would we know Ignaz if we saw him, right? Like, how do we not buy into the vaccine is working, mainstream medicine is telling us the vaccine, everything's great, but there is some voice of dissent. How do we know that that voice of dissent is not rational and reasonable and correct like Semmelweis was, um, whereas mainstream medicine at the time wasn't? How do we know we're on the right side of history? He always has a fun place in my heart because some attending when I was in medical school 20 years ago said, you know, do you know about Semmelweis? I was like, no, I haven't heard of him. And he just hung his head in disgust and sort of walked away. <laughs> back, back, when, back when it was okay for attending doctors to be uh, horrible to medical students. Yeah. yeah, but right. So, I mean, just a little bit of background. He was, I think, a Hungarian obstetrician in the 1850s or something like this before germ theory who realized uh, that when medical students delivered babies, uh, something like a quarter of the patients died. And when midwives delivered babies, it was like 1%. And the reason was this for this is that medical students were going right from the morgue to the delivery room and without washing their hands. And uh, he figured, he didn't know about germ theory at the time, but he figured that it was some sort of uh, ether, something like that, that they were carrying on their, that, you know, the, the stench of death. So he had them wash their hands and he had data that, uh, that, that uh, you know, uh, postpartum deaths plummeted. So, so that's probably the main way that we recognize uh, the next Simmelweis is that they have evidence. And, and the history of medicine is full of this. It's, it's full of people who were sort of dismissed as crackpots, but they turned out to be right. One of the ones in our lifetime, though we were probably young kids, and I, uh, Barry Marshall and I want to say Robin Williams, I, I'm butchering their names, but they uh, proved that gastric ulcers were caused by H. pylori. Right, rather and then he stress. drank Correct. H. pylori and gave himself an ulcer. Correct, yes. and won a Nobel Prize for that. But what I think is sometimes forgotten is that the history of medicine is much, 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 much fuller of people who came up with, you know, so-called crazy ideas and they were laughed at in their times and they were dismissed by mainstream medicine and they were right to be dismissed, but they are sort of forgotten to history. And, and one of the, there was a, there was a museum I went to as a kid called the Museum of Questionable Medical Devices, but it was just full of, it was in Minnesota. I think the collection still exists, but it was just full of ancient, you know, are not even ancient, but, you know, from the fifties, you know, quack cures and this sort of thing. And they're forgotten to history. You may actually call that the, the survival bias, right? That we only remember the, 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 the people who were called crazy and turned out to be right but the people who were called crazy and they were crazy uh, get get forgotten to history. So I, I think we we recognize the next Ignald Simmelweis. They they have to have data. They have to have evidence uh, that that whatever they're claiming is right. So I think that's that's the most important thing because ultimately it, it comes down to evidence. And as long as uh, people have that evidence, 
that's what it takes. In my own field of multiple sclerosis, this is going to be a little bit esoteric, um, but for many years, it was thought that B cells play no role in the disorder. But now, probably the number one treatment for it is a, is a medicine called ocrelizumab, which is an is a anti-B cell, a monoclonal antibody, which really stops the disease in its tracks. And if you had suggested this to people 15 years ago, they probably would have laughed you out of the room. But, uh, you know, Ocrevus was, or Ocrelizumab was studied in two large, or three large trials, and it was shown to be effective. And you, you can't argue with that data. Have you ever successfully changed someone's mind by pointing out their cognitive biases? Um, no. So, so I think one thing about cognitive biases is, is you're sort of blind to them, that you can't see them in yourself. It's like when I listen to this podcast, uh, I will say, boy, do I really sound like that? I really sound like that. So it's sort of like hearing your voice. But I think you know, some doctors on Twitter have argued essentially that it's never worth discussing vaccines because you won't change anyone's mind. And I think that's right for a Twitter conversation, right? Like you're not going to just meet someone and and have them say, "Oh my God, you're everything I knew about vaccines was 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 wrong," and, and you've convinced me. But like I said, at least with this COVID vaccine, right now, minds are very impressionable. Okay, so I think it's very important to have these conversations now before people get entrenched. Okay. That's number one. And then when you think like, you know, I have changed my mind about a lot of things in the past few years. Okay. Partially reality has made, you know, the state of our country and politics and this pandemic have made me rethink a lot of things, but you know, other things have happened as well. And when I think about things I've changed my mind about, there was never an aha moment. There was never like, and now I think completely different about X, Y, Z, but it's only sort of looking back and thinking, boy, you know, the 35-year-old the me would look at the 45-year-old me and think that guy's kind of a lunar, you know, or that guy's, you know, believes some, some ideas that I very, very much oppose. So it, it was a very slow process. And I think most people can sort of look back at things they thought 10 years ago that were wrong and things that they would disagree with themselves about 10 years ago. And it was never sort of a, an aha moment. You just sort of have to chip away. And there's a website run by a pediatrician, Vince Ionelli, I'm probably butchering his name as well, called Vaxopedia, which is just, as the name implies, sort of Wikipedia but for vaccines. And he has a whole collection of anecdotes and stories about people who changed their mind about vaccines. And, you know, you read through them and it was, that's exactly what they describe, a very, you know, subtle sort of process of beginning to question some of the anti-vaccine beliefs. And I think I remember one point that I wanted to make before, which is a, a, a definitely something that we want to avoid, definitely with this vaccine, is politicizing it, is making it like masks, making it a marker of, you know, if you're wearing a mask, you're blue Democrat, if you're not wearing a mask, you're a red Republican. That's something we really want to avoid with this vaccine is making it a, a cultural signifier. It might be unavoidable. Wasn't that thrust upon us though? You know, was it, yes. do, you think, do you think it was the, and I think we both align similarly, that was thrust upon us by the right who said, you know, who dismissed masks. And once that person did, Trump, just name him, once he did that, the cat was out of the bag because people just aligned themselves with that. And there was, there was nothing that we could have done to change that. The fallout yes. was there. And, and this is why I agree with you. You're absolutely right. It was out of our hands at that point. But this is why I've seen some people say, oh, Trump shouldn't get any credit for the vaccine. You know, he had nothing to do with it. I'm like, hey, listen, let him call yeah. it the Trump vaccine. Yes. It, you know, I actually, you know, when, when I said before about we want people modeling this, I, I would love to have Donald Trump publicly get the vaccine and his family publicly get the vaccine. And, you know, they wouldn't do it, I don't think, out of altruism and wanting high uptake of this. They would, you know, want it for attention and to build their brand. And I guess I just am politicizing things in a way I said we shouldn't do, but there, <laughs> but there you go, it's too late. But, uh, but I'm, I, I'd be fine with that. I would actually be thrilled if they did that. And if they, can, if they say, if Donald Trump gets there and says, I'm getting this vaccine and I developed this in record speed, this was my government, this was a historic achievement, fine, fine with me. 
And he'd be right. It is a historic achievement. I think that's one thing that we shouldn't lose sight of is, and I almost always tear up when I say this, you know, and I do make this point to my patients. I say, you know, going from a virus that we didn't know existed a year ago to not only designed vaccines, but completed successful multiple phase three trials is the single greatest scientific achievement of my lifetime. I mean, it's up there with the moon landing. It's up there. Uh, it, it's just a, astonishing. And the, the folks from Moderna apparently designed the vaccine, you know, the theoretical, you know, how are they going to make the protein, um, the mRNA in, in, in two days? Again, they, they had to start doing this. They weren't just, you know, starting from scratch in their kitchen, which again, I think is a very important point to make, but it's, it's really an astonishing uh, achievement and it gives me hope. And it's, it's great that we're having this conversation today. I don't know when people are going to listen to this, but today I think is World Smallpox Eradication Day. And so it, it is the day when 1979 or 1978 smallpox was officially declared eliminated from the world. So it just gives me hope that, that humanity has conquered these challenges before. And one thing that I did quite a bit during the pandemic was look out of Bellevue Hospital windows onto Roosevelt Island and there is a ruined building there. And uh, this, is a, this is an island in the East River where a lot of people live. And um, there's a university there. But there's this old, like, castle there. I don't know if you've ever seen it or not, but it's... A, I used to live on the other side of the river. Okay, uh, okay. I used to live in Long Island City and look at it from the other side. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's yep. Renwick Smallpox Hospital. And there used to be smallpox hospitals all around all around the world. And just seeing that ruin sort of inspired me, knowing that humanity uh, has met uh, a challenge uh, as big as COVID before and overcome it. So I'm optimistic about things. Yeah, I think uh, as two New Yorkers, when when everything was happening in April, if someone had told me that or if someone had asked me, when do I think they're going to have a vaccine? I, I never would have predicted that we'd have it this quickly. I never would have thought that, I never would have ho- thought to hope that something would be completed this quickly. It's yeah, no, may, may, maybe it was, maybe it was um, you know, people were sort of psychologically preparing themselves for the long haul, but all of the vaccine experts were saying four years, five years, if we're lucky. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's truly an astonishing achievement. And I, I think if you are able to communicate that to patients and say, you know, listen, I know that you're afraid of this, but just take a step back and think, you know, think how fortunate, you know, just what a miracle uh, th- this truly is. You know, and 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 how lucky we are. Uh, you know, just think think about the the, the positive that way, yeah. and just let them know we're all in this together. That that you know that we can start going to sporting events and concerts and you know churches and synagogues again. Not if just if you get the vaccine, but if you get the vaccine and your ten neighbors get the vaccine. I think with with regards to the the how quickly it came out. I like to point out to my patients that the the human genome originally took 13 years and a billion dollars to sequence. And now you can sequence it in a day or two for mm, three to five grand. So just the technology, when previous vaccines were developed versus the technology that we have now, it is just, it's worlds apart. It's worlds yeah. apart. Think of where your phone was when the measles vaccine was being developed and, you know, even something like that. Just, it, it's... You know, it's it. It's easier to conceptualize like how long it would take to download to open a program on my Commodore sixty four, right? Whereas turning on my laptop now and the amount of data is in there. So no, that's know. a great point. I never thought about that before. That yeah, you can make all these sort of other analogies to to you know to to other products that are just miraculously better in our than- lives that we just accept. We just accept once we have this new phone and it's fast. It, we just accept it. So we need to be able to. I think do that with the with the vaccine as well, with the appropriate amount of skepticism. Correct. So Jonathan Howard, you are, uh, again, I recommend that everybody follows you on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle? I think it's J Howard Brain MD. I can confirm that. It is J okay. Howard Brain MD. But, by the way, I hope I don't get a lot of new followers. I, I like sort of being as little small potatoes because that way I can post sort of, you know, weird things, a guitar song that I wrote or just some sort of weird random thought. Uh, that pops into my head without sort of having to worry that I, uh, you know, 
if, if some of the big name doctors on Twitter did that, you know, people would think they lost their minds. So I am the Joe Rogan of otolaryngology. So you might find that you're getting, you know, seven or eight more Twitter followers yeah. after this. Perfect. I, I don't <laughs> mind remaining small. And, and your book, Cognitive Errors and Diagnostic Mistakes, A Case-Based Guide to Critical Thinking in Medicine. That, that's the, the cognitive biases and heuristics that we talk about there are, are also discussed in, in your book in a different way. And actually, we're going to be doing another episode to just help us all be better doctors by, by recognizing some of the cognitive errors that, that we make. But given how timely the vaccine discussion is, we, we decided to cover that first. So I really appreciate your time and all the great work that you're doing. And uh, I look forward to more tweets. All right. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Such a great show with Dr. Jonathan Howard. But before we end, let's give you the link for our sponsor again. If you need help reviewing your employment contract before you sign, reach out to a company with great online reviews and reputation for doing that and more. Find Resolve at drpodcastnetwork.com slash resolve to get the review process started today. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.